seated. We welcome all to our worship this morning, and may the Lord bless you and bless you in the presence, in his presence, as we gather together in Jesus' name. And we are reminded, even as we sing, that holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. We are in the presence of the holy God by faith. Amazing things uh, happen here, and number one of which is that the holy God does not consume us as we deserve but he dwells with us in the person of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. We hear now from the Word of God, the Holy Word of God, and the Holy Law of God, as is the tradition in the Reformed faith and Presbyterian faith. We want to know the revealed will of God for us. And in this, as we go through the commandments in Exodus 20, we're reminded that they reveal, as do all of God's words, his holiness. And I believe, don't you, that this is therefore a way in which we can not only appreciate God's holiness, but be holy, as he calls us. This is, in fact, what the sermon is all about this morning, that the justified ones who know the grace of Jesus Christ are at the same time sanctified and called to be holy. And so Exodus chapter 20, this great uh, word of God and which, remember, was received by the people of Israel as they were at the Mount of Sinai, and Moses, the mediator, was, was receiving these commandments of God. There were thunderings. There was a smoke on the mountain. The people dared not approach the mountain lest they be killed by the holy God. And I believe that it's necessary, don't you, that we receive the same law with some awe and reverence. For God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. The third commandment of God, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who's within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, that's the sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery, the seventh commandment. You shall not steal, that's the eighth commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, the ninth commandment. And the tenth commandment is this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now, the Lord Jesus himself, when he was asked what is the great commandment of the law, obliged the fellow who asked and has condescended to have this revealed in his word for us for all time. He was asked, what's the great commandment of the law? He was told, we are told, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, With all your strength, with all your soul, with all your mind, with everything in you, you shall love him who loved you and called you out of the Egypt of sin. And to confirm this, and like unto this great commandment, you shall love the neighbor as yourself. May the Lord bless us with holiness, such as becomes those who've been brought out of Egypt to serve the Lord. We sing now in response to the reading of the law of God and That's number 295 in the Psalter hymnal, When Morning Lights the Eastern Skies. 
even lightening it through the snow and through the cold. When morning lights the eastern skies, O Lord, thy mercy show. On thee alone my hope relies. Let me thy kindness know. Four stanzas, 295. That was a versification of Psalm 143. It always is uh, to be remembered that these psalms in the Old Testament are like so many spiritual biographies. They, they paint the life of a child of God, and children of God. Old Testament and also the New Testament. It's the Word of God. And also very lovely and, and comforting to know is that the psalmist who lived under the dispensation of the law and Moses and all the commandments that regulated the lives of the people of Israel, nevertheless knew the grace of God and knew the kindness of God. And so he pleads, Lord, remember me in your kindness, your faithfulness, your love to show. Now, people of God, we need to know this, don't we? We need to know that God is kind and faithful and of a tender heart towards us because we're sinners. We need forgiveness, and we need to know that God receives us as we trust in him. Not of any hoops we have to go through is the gospel all about. It's about receiving the Lord. And I believe many of our troubles stem from the fact that we just don't get that. We don't get grace. We don't receive it. We don't comprehend it. And our lives are messed up as a result of it. But let's go back to grace, shall we? and loveliness and kindness and tender mercy of the Lord, behold in the word of God. And how important to do this as we do the one thing that is the greatest response of a child of God. You know what that one thing is. We're going to pray. Let's pray. Father, prayerful has been our worship. Prayerful. Hitherto and now, in a formal sort of way by one who on the behalf of a congregation of of sinners saved by grace is seeking to lead the way into the holy sanctum, the presence of God. And Lord, we pray for grace to pray. Surely when the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray, they were concerned with that. They beheld 
How spontaneous were the prayers of the mediator in their midst. How he could spend all night in prayer, not be bored or distracted, but in sinless communion with God was Jesus always. And when he prayed and when he poured out his heart to the Father, the disciples beheld something they needed, they did not have in themselves. We pray the prayer of the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray as we're praying. For it's a hard lesson to learn, Lord, communion with you, talking to you, and especially perhaps receiving your words in our praying, listening. We live in an age that doesn't listen. We just go about human doings more than human beings. We scuttle about and we're on our way and we're rushing. We don't have time to listen or desire to listen to God. We don't have the faith that we ought to have. And Lord, we pray, bless us with listening ears in our speaking words to you and of you and of your praises. And if there's some father in our midst, one, some, maybe all, keenly feeling the need to listen, we pray especially bless them, bless us all, with ears, with sensitivity to your word, with a biblical reckoning of things that you have spoken and would speak to us this morning. How we need this, Lord. The words of devils are many. The cacophony, the vain noise of devils and their minions are many in this world. From the times and the news days and the presses, from the universities come noise so often. And from hell itself comes noise. And we ourselves are part of the problem, Lord, we confess to you. We're not so word-like as we ought to be. We confess that Jesus is the word, your communication, but how, how often we don't listen to what he says. How often we go our way and maybe when we're in some sort of religious moment, we take time and we devote ourselves in a little way, offer a little prayer, as we say. But Lord, it's all wrong that religions should be so compartmentalized, so unnatural, so hard. God, we pray, bless us with soft hearts, listening ears, and a resolution of a will that's desirous to love you. Give us, Lord, to be more like Jesus, your only begotten Son. Give us, Lord, to be proper children of yours who know forgiveness, who know that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus and who walk that way. And we know that as justified and sanctified sinners bound for glory in all of our wandering about here below, bound for glory. May our children know that, Lord, and our young people. The church of today and tomorrow, and we know that in our older years, some very old in the congregation and who may be visiting, friends, God bless, we pray. May there be from the young and from the old and all in between, from the single, from the married, from those with children, those without, from grandparents, grandchildren, those new to the faith, those not, this utterance of faith and praise, this expression, this life, this liveliness that shows there is a God who's great and greatly to be praised because he lives and he's created all things and he has a plan and he's executed it and is performing it as we pray to save a people to himself. Lord, how exciting. How exciting, Lord, is this to be reminded of what you are and who you are, what you do, what you plan, your goals, your heaven, your son. Lord, we pray, give us your spirit, the spirit of your son, to be more in communion with you. 
Give us your truth to be the light upon our pathway. Give that, Father, for students, students at this very college who may be worshiping with us, light upon their path to discern things that are taught, things that they read, to know your will, to know your will with regard to relationship, calling, vocation, Lord, whatever, that they may be assured. May they worship you, Father, and may in academia and getting a degree, there not be worship put on hold and church life be put on hold, but may there be this robust education in the communion of the saints, even as they go to these places of learning. And we pray, Father, bless those who are weary, those who are downhearted, downcast, even nigh unto despair. Oh, may they know your peace. Maybe those dealing with medical issues, we pray that they may know the great physician. We pray, Father, those dealing with marital problems or other problems of relationship that are of import and and really are very killing and very hurting. God bless, we pray, with reconciliation so that there may be among the two in a marriage Jesus Christ in the midst and him the center and the focus. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless our little congregation with the great big grace of God. Bless us, Lord, with great fruit. Bless us, Lord, with a vitality that is appealing to those who are seeking the life of Christ in the midst of their own life. And Lord, we pray, receive us and bless us now as we give presently to your cause, as we preach your gospel and hear it. May we never be the same. May it be for an advancement in godliness, in piety, from the head to the toe and all in between so that our lives, because you have been merciful, may be a response to that mercy in Jesus and sacrifices, thank offerings of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Your offering for the general fund of this church will now be received. Let's sing now number 26 in the Psalter hymnal, versification of Psalm 18. One, two, four, and six. One, two, four, and six of 26.
We have heard in the last couple of weeks the truth of justification by faith alone. And we were reminded from the gospel that Paul brought forth in Galatians in chapter 1 that that gospel of justification by faith alone is the only gospel. There is no other gospel. The problem that Paul was addressing as he wrote the letter to the Galatians was that others were bringing another gospel that was no gospel because it was a denial of justification by faith alone. There was the attempt by some to add to uh, the gospel works of the law that we must do in order to earn salvation, and especially circumcision and the keeping of certain ceremonial requirements was being foisted upon the church, and they were being bewitched. And so Paul has to rebuke the Galatians. But we, we learned about that in our very first sermon, and also, therefore, of the importance of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Last time, we went to the book of Romans, that other championship book of the Bible that uh, upholds the truth of justification by faith alone. And we saw from chapter 4 and verse 5 that God is the one who uh, justifies the ungodly so that it's not because of works but only because of faith or through faith that there is this justification, this acquittal at the tribunal of God. An awesome statement of the apostle, and I trust that that has sunken into our hearts and enlightened our minds in the congregation, and that others who would be visiting would appreciate this awesome truth of justification by faith alone, which is the justification of the ungodly, such as you are and I am by nature. At this time, we want to consider, as we uh, are ending this mini-series on justification by faith alone, a certain objection, an objection to the gospel of justification by faith alone that goes something like this. If you say that you're saved by grace alone through faith alone, why then do you continue to live a holy life because all you have to do is live whatever, it doesn't matter, you're saved by grace alone. And so you can have maybe the best of both worlds. You can be a Christian after a fashion, but also you can go to the bars and frequent houses of ill repute even, and you're still justified because it's not up to you at all. That's the objection to the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Thankfully, the Apostle Paul meets it head on. Before we had to deal with this, the apostle himself was dealing with this objection, whether it's theoretical or whether there was someone who was objecting to this, we don't know. But if you turn with me to Romans 6, we'll learn about this objection and the answer that the apostle gives to the objection to justification by faith alone. Romans 6 and verses 1 through 11, we're going to read those verses. And again, it's in light of what the apostle has been teaching, that we're justified freely by the grace that is in Jesus and through faith alone. His statement in Romans 6, 1 is a conclusion of all this. What shall we say then or therefore? He's been saying something. That's the then, children. Now he's going to be saying something that's a conclusion. What shall we say then in light of all that we've been talking about? And the question is this, anticipating an objection. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that the conclusion of justification by faith alone? Being justified freely by the blood of the Lamb. Is that what we say? And here's what Paul says. King James says, God forbid... My new King James says, certainly not. Me genoita. God forbid that we continue in sin, that grace may abound. And the question is, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk 
in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we all shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thus far we read this portion of God's word. After it, you will note follow other conclusions based on the doctrines he brings forth. We want to consider this first two verses, though, of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? As we've been seeing, people of God, the the doctrine of justification by faith alone, that teaching in Holy Writ is... and was the main hinge of the Protestant Reformation, according to Calvin. That is, everything swung on it. Everything was opened up by it. All the truths of the riches of redemption in and through Jesus Christ and his grace. The Reformers even called this the the material principle of the Reformation, the formal principle being the authority of the Word of God alone over popes and bishops, cardinals, and over private opinions. So this material, uh, uh, material doctrine or principle of the Reformation, justification by faith alone, held in high estimation by the Reformers and by Luther himself, who called justification by faith alone the mark by which a, sta- a church stands or falls. If you have the doctrine, you will stand. If you deny or compromise the doctrine of grace and justification by faith alone, you will fall. You will apostatize. Sadly, we see this in the church today. They've lost the hinge on the door that they're trying to opening to people, maybe trying to open it too wide and get in the crowds. And so they compromise the truth of justification by faith alone for some more popular doctrine that, that tickles the, the pride of man in one way or another. It's seen as well because of the doctrine of justification by faith being denied or compromised that there is a falling of the church, a departure from things that are vital to any kind of vibrant, gospel-oriented church. We see, in fact, all kinds of innovations being added to the worship service because the message is not now so powerful and so God-centered, and so we think we need to have a song and a dance. And for the message is substituted method, and which is contrary to what the biblical way is. The gospel itself, Paul would say in Romans 1, 17 and following, is the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, to all who believe. The gospel itself, unadulterated, the pure word of heaven, of the grace of God, is the power of God unto salvation. I would say, in addition to justification being the main hinge and a mark by which the church stands or falls, that it's a block meaning that it's a foundational block of doctrine in any church that is worthy of the name Christian church. Sadly, many are stumbling over the block. One way they stumble is, as I said in prior words, is that they cannot imagine that justification by faith would yield a life of godliness. They can't imagine that if it's just the case that Jesus paid it all, and that he's our mediator completely, that we would have to any incentive whatsoever to do anything for Jesus' sake. 
That's the argument. And so people inject the will of man or the working of man or some other hoop through which you have to jump in order to be a real Christian. And so they compromise the gospel and pretty soon even Protestants are preaching a sort of works righteousness having denied that our righteousness is only in Christ alone. So we need to consider this justification one more time, which is a block, but also a stumbling block to many. We ourselves want to respond in this way. First of all, may there be preaching. May you desire preaching. May the elders of this congregation insist on the preaching of the gospel of the pure grace of God in Jesus Christ. Secondly, may there be piety. That is, may there be an adornment of the doctrines of grace with something that is becoming for those who truly believe. That's piety. From head to toe and all in between, may there be this godly response, not to the compromise of the gospel but adorning the gospel and flowing out of the gospel, this is something which is being championed by the apostle in our text where he asks the question, what shall we then say in response to the gospel? And shall we sin that grace may abound? So I want to consider this text for our piety and preaching, justification, what shall we then say? First question I want to consider, or first point, is that there is a question here being asked, which is from hell. Secondly, an answer that is from heaven, it's an answer of truth. And then finally, I believe that there is a solution here, a way that is the way forward for principle and piety, for grace and godliness, and that has to do with the reckoning of faith how we are to reckon the truths of the gospel, to think upon them, react to them. Well, I want us to start at the beginning, at the foundation for the question the apostle is asking. What shall we say then? There's the word then. Go back. By way of review, may be new to some people. The apostle has been preaching and pulling out all the stops, as it were. Old Testament references are are here uh, right and left, verse after verse. They're piling, piled up one upon another, and implications of this are being drawn to teach that we are justified by faith alone. Now, what is that doctrine? Briefly, it's the doctrine that we are declared to be right with God by the instrument of faith alone on the basis of the redemption that's in Christ Jesus alone. And so the apostle in Romans 3 has said that we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this redemption and this wonderful justification being made right with God now gets to us. That's how you you see this, children. It gets to us personally by this great gift called faith. That is no condition that we fulfill in order to be saved. It's no other work that we add to the works of the Old Testament, it's simply an instrument. Or as the Belgian Confession says, it's a hand that God gives us whereby we receive freely all that is in Jesus Christ. Again, this is the cardinal doctrine of the church and the gospel that the apostle brings. It is what Jesus brings as well. Pauline theology is not different than Jesus' theology. For Jesus is the one, isn't he, who said... I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he comes and he's the champion of grace, if ever there was one, being the mediator of grace. We're declared right with God. We. And last time, we were insulted, if I can put this, by the word that dared to say that this justification of us is the justification of ungodly folks. Note that, Romans 4, 5. Again, Paul pulling out the stops and painting us all black. He says, even Abraham, the father of the faithful, the one in whom you Jews might be relying upon as as the champion of works righteousness, even he was justified while ungodly. 
Even though he was a good man and even though he, he walked according to the ways that God was calling him, albeit imperfectly, nevertheless, in principle, being a son of Adam, ungodly, that is against God, not like God, not meriting anything with God, certainly. That's the key to the Reformation's doctrine, the biblical doctrine. If we would exalt God and say, indeed, he's great and greatly to be praised for his grace, we have to be low and little and reckon that we are indeed in Adam, ungodly. Well, we are declared right by a forensic declaration, a declaration of God, the judge. It's a legal decree that there is no thing that is against us in a court of law. That's what justification is. As Paul will say later in Romans 8, there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We'll get back to that verse later. But later on he says, there may be people who would lay charges. There may be people and things in your life which are against you. And devils would come up to you and whisper to you and say, yes, but this and this and this. And maybe they're doing that even now. But the apostle says, if you are in Christ Jesus and justified by him freely by his grace, if he has earned for you heaven, then heaven is for you and you are bound for heaven because God himself will not hold anything against you. Now that is the worth of the cross of Calvary, isn't it? That's everything. That's why we preach Christ crucified here. And we want to know the fruits of his gospel in your life because that is something that gives glory to God. So we're justified. That's the then. What shall we say then? That's what he's been preaching this all about. And, and just recently, that is just prior to this text in Romans, uh, Romans 6, the apostle has been engaging in this amazing discussion, if we can call biblical truth discussions, of how, just how we were saved by this way, by what's called representation. Romans 5, 12 and following, you read of the comparison of Adam, in whom all died, and Christ, in whom many are made alive. There's a comparison and also a contrast drawn there, so that Adam is the one who represented sinners when he fell, and all fell, therefore, in Adam, because we were in him. But Christ is the one in whom God's people are saved as the new representative. The wonderful contrast, the, the second Adam, as it were, who's the mediator, and who is this so that there's an abundance of things that are gotten through Jesus Christ that could not, of course, be gotten through Adam. But there's also an abundant contrast. Death came in Adam. Ah, but life in Jesus. And so the apostle, if you just look at that text, don't have time to do this here. He speaks in, in this parallelism. And he speaks of the offense coming by one and the free gift by another. But, but then he, he, he says it's, it's far greater than just a parallel. There's something greater than that has happened in Jesus Christ and his representation of us. And, and you have to see this, he's saying. So it's the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, verse 15, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace of the one man, capital M, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Over and over again, the word abound. And I want to just pause there, make an application. Not a rabbit hole sort of application, but a necessary one. That if we get the gospel, it's all about abundance and the generosity of heaven. It's all about God pouring out treasures from heaven in Jesus. If we receive this all by faith, if we understand just a little bit of the life of God, it's, it's this abundant life that Jesus, the mediator, came to give. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly, he says. That's what grace does. It makes for this abundant, eternal life situation and condition and reality. And it's all something that, that came through this, ter this, this wonderful, terrific 
an awesome display of grace on Calvary and this justification of us personally through faith. And indeed, we have to say this again in application. It's this grace that's happened and this justification that's happened to the chief of sinners. Who's that? Who's that? Who's the chief of sinners? Paul said he was, didn't he? We must say we are. You see, it's very personal, receiving all of this, getting this, and the congregation getting this, and families teaching this, and we as a family teaching this together. It's all about understanding just how sinful we are, how ungodly we are in ourselves, how in need of a mediator we are. It doesn't matter whether you're three or 93. Get this. Get this before you die that you might live now to God's praise. Grace abounds to sinners, the chief of sinners even, because we have a wonderful plan and mediator of God. Well, the conclusion is, shall we then sin? So he's following upon this whole discussion of the abundance that there is in Christ, Could have gone back as well to the fact that there was this abounding of grace when the law came, so that when the law was instituted in Israel, that magnified the grace of God, so that Israel could know in its transgressing the law more and more its sinfulness. They had the law spelled out now. It's one of the reasons we read the commandments every day can't get away from the Word of God saying, you shall do this, and your conscience saying, but I don't. It's, it's a real lawyer is the law, teaching us, pointing us as, uh, to us as a prosecutor of who we are in ourselves, who we were last week, what we were doing on the Internet or at the bar. It, it, it goes into the crevices and into the heart. Well, the argument could be, well, that means maybe that if we sin and it's all free, well, then God's grace is going to be magnified all the more. If God's grace is magnified in the giving of the law and especially in salvation freely in Jesus, well then, there's a little hole here. In fact, a great big door through which we can enter, the door of sinfulness and all of this, so that when... When God brings us back and justifies us anyway, His grace will be magnified. That's something? That would be the logical reasoning here. Why don't don't we sin? Why don't we sin? Well, I would present to you this, that I believe that though there may be some justification of the question and the concern about the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Most of the questions, especially the questions that persist and all of the questions that persist so that they compromise the gospel are not born of good motives, but they're born of hell and compromise. They're born of unbelief because it's a real understand, a misunderstanding of the gospel, not only, but a rejection of it. The people who say this don't understand the then of the apostle. They just go on and talk and think that they're making conclusions from the gospel, but they're not. That's the problem. If ever, let me put it this way, if ever the worthiness of the cross and the grace of grace is compromised one whit in any doctrine of the church or any thinking of theologians. That is not just ignorance. That is rejection of the gospel. That is not a gospel. That is not a godly attempt. But instead, it is an ungodly attempt to foist up man or to foist an implic- in a, a commandment upon men which actually is building up the pride of man and pulling down the righteousness that God imputes to us. 
That's what's happening here. In fact, we can ask, we can ask that question, and we sometimes do. Well, I'll just sin, but God will forgive me, we can say. You ever ask that, children, young people? Ah, it's all right. Usually we don't get so articulate about the question because we know it's wrong. We know it's a bad excuse for sinning. Oh, just this once. But that's what we can do. And the apostle here, remember, this, this, this question could be very real in the minds of people who are the justified, who nevertheless have what's called the flesh in them. So I don't want to minimize the question or to think it's just a theoretical thing, but I would submit to you we always are somehow dabbling with this question. Why? Because we have something yet in us called the flesh. Oh, yes, we're justified. We're declared right with God. But there's a sinfulness in us still. This old man of sin, the apostle would say, against which he wrestles. Just turn to the next chapter. The apostle Paul, the regenerated apostle, shares his wrestling match with himself. And he says, the good that I would, I don't do. The evil that I would not, that I do. And I'm in a straight betwixt this this two, this, this going toward the good and this doing the evil. And it's like I'm incapable of being perfect and holy like I want to be. Later on in the book of Galatians. Interesting how in Romans and Galatians this is brought forward. But Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, the apostle says, here's the reality. Here's the reality in light of the exhortation, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Here's the reality. For the flesh lusts against the spirit in us and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. He's pointing to the contrariness of ourselves. We're justified, yet there's still this flesh. And this, I submit to you, leads to questions, doesn't it? It's the beginning of the end when we have these questions, and we don't stifle these questions and come to the truth, but we have these questions. It's the the process of sin and the birthing of sin which is born of this question, which is born, I submit, of hell through the flesh. Shall we not sin? We're saved by grace. Mom's not looking. Dad's not looking. Wife's not looking. Husband's not looking. God will forgive us. That's what we do. And the apostle says, God forbid. See, he's putting the stop right on it. What shall we say then? Shall we question like this? Shall we continue in sin that is in a lifestyle of sin that grace may abound? No. Dead wrong. Wrong question. Stupid question. Foolish. Born of the infernal and of hell. Foolish. Because we're dead to sin. That's the truth. And how shall we, who are dead to sin, live any longer therein? That's what he's saying. You know what the apostle is saying? Not that sin is dead in us, or that we never sin. No. Again, Romans 7 tells us that and all the exhortations of the New Testament are to sinners saved by grace, and yet they're sinners still. We're sinning saints, we're saints who are sinners. That's the dual reality. There's a contrariness in us, and it will be all the way to heaven. And that's the glory of heaven, and I hope you're longing for that glory of heaven. You won't have any sin anymore. And you can praise God perfectly in all the dumb questions that we ask. I speak as a man, dumb questions. Won't be asked anymore. We'll all be born of faith if we have questions, and I think we will. But we're dead to sin. See that? Dead to sin. Death, dead with regard to sin's realm and reign, as I would put it and summarize for you. First of all, dead to the realm of sin, meaning we don't live any longer where death lives. Death valley. We're no longer in death valley. We're no longer those who are in the kingdom of, of death and the kingdom of man. We're in the kingdom of heaven. 
This is what he's trying to say to us here. That's not our realm. We're in a different planet as Christians, he's saying. Something has happened. As a result of justification, as we shall see, we're now sanctified and on the way to glory. But this is what dead to sin means, first of all. You're dead with regard to that realm. You're not there yet, or anymore, I should say. You're not in that dominion, even, that reign of sin. That's what Paul will say later on. You are dead to sin that it should not reign in you anymore. That's the point. You're not in the sphere, the country of death. You're not in Death Valley. And you're not in the dominion of sin, which is likened to a tyrant here. That's the, the conclusion that Paul is saying. That's what he's saying should be the basis of your questioning or not and the basis of your reasoning as a Christian. You're dead to sin and its realm and its reign. And then he goes on to say, this is all because of this wonderful thing that's happened through the representation of Jesus Christ. We are now incorporated into him. Verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, his death, Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into his death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, this is something the apostle is moving on to say here in advance from what he said before. Jesus represented us. Adam used to. Now Jesus does. He stands in our place. He stood in our place on Calvary. But something more now has happened. As a result of this gift of faith, what has happened is we are so incorporated into Christ as his body, so joined to him organically, as we say, in a living union, that in some mysterious way, we are participants and beneficiaries of his work, dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. And especially with his work, dying on the cross, so that He's dead to sin and therefore we in him and is being raised from the dead and risen unto God so that he's alive to God. So now we are too. Now that, in so many bumbling words, is what is the truth here. Not only does Jesus represent us legally as a legal representative, your honor, they're mine. I have paid for their sins. God the Father, your honor, they're mine. But also, he stood for us, he stands for us as our living head, the head of the church, which is his body. And Because of this, the Apostle Paul says, we are not only associated with the Christ who's for us, but we are those who are in a vital way connected to the Christ who's in us and we in him. And here is the ground that the apostle gives for everything else he's going to say in the whole book of Romans. We're justified, and we're now sanctified in Christ Jesus. We're made holy. And it's such a principal and wonderful and powerful work of God that it involves this complete and principal separation of sin as Jesus himself was separated from sin. Now, what does that mean? Do you notice that? And later on, it will say that Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, died to sin. Well, he never had any sin. But the fact is, he bore sin. He bore our sin. He was in the realm and under the dominion, as it were, not personally of sin, but he was under this wrath of God for sin. But when he died, this is the apostle's argument, it's no more. He died with regard to that humiliation, with regard to that sin bearing. He has nothing to do with it anymore. It's born once and for all, and it's born and carried all away. Now what he's saying, dear ones, is that this has happened to you somehow you were with Jesus on the cross. That's what faith does. It takes you back to the work of the mediator. And just as there was this death to sin, then for him, it's so with you. You are taken from the realm and the dominion of sin. 
I believe it's even talking here in these negative terms, death to sin and burial and so on, of glory. Jesus Christ, after all, after he died and was buried and rose again, was glorified. This is what has happened to us. If we're his, if we're justified, this is the further reality, the consequence of the justification of the sons of God. Sanctification, participation in the wonderful liberation from sin and so that we live positively as he rose, we rise from the death of sin and we live unto righteousness. We walk in a new and holy life. Now that's what the apostle is saying here. And I don't want to get into, though I'll just maybe comment a little bit, into baptism being mentioned here, and certainly not to the debate about the mode of baptism, but do want to say that the apostle is certainly not saying here that we're buried with Jesus through baptism automatically through the external pouring on of water, dipping in or sprinkling or whatever. doesn't matter. Not saying that. If you look at a parallel passage in Colossians 2 where the same truth is brought out, Circumcision there is compared to baptism, and the apostle distinctly reminds the Colossians who would hold on to the head Jesus alone and not to ordinances of men that circumcision doesn't matter a whit. And we ought to say this too. Baptism, though an important ordinance in the church, is not an automatic into the kingdom of heaven. The external pouring on of water or immersion doesn't matter The point is, we are united to Christ in what baptism signifies in the cleansing work of Calvary. That's the point. And what Paul is trying to impress upon the people here is the work of Christ for us and in us and making us participants of him. And he's certainly not going back into the elemental sort of Christianity and certainly not works righteousness, even the work of baptism. But point is, it's all of Jesus. And now we have to, and this is my final point, reckon with this. Reckon with this. We are those who want to avoid the ignorance of many who do not know, who are ignorant of, verse 3, the fact that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We want to know and we want to reckon with the fact that we are those, in fact, who are in Jesus Christ and freed from the dominion and the realm and the power, the uh, enslaving power of sin. We have to think upon this. In fact, in these verses is the first exhortation, I believe, in Romans. There's lots of facts that are set forth in Romans. But this is the first or one of the first exhortations in Romans. And it has to do with reckoning with the, uh, the truth of wonderful liberation that is in Jesus Christ. Where to know this, verse 6, or reckon with this, that our old man was crucified him. We're, we're to reckon with, with everything, everything that happened in Calvary's tree, and now has happened through faith. And that, people of God, is the first response we ought to give to this wonderful justification and sanctification. Think about it. Don't add to it. Don't add to it. Don't ask the silly questions, is this a way that we can sin now? No, just think upon this. That's what he's saying. Know this. Don't be ignorant of this truth. Have the truth have its way in you. Oh, maybe a good idea as well is to hear this through the preaching by which faith comes, the apostle will say in Romans 10, and which gospel preaching is the power of God unto salvation. It works faith and it works this conviction that, yes, we are those who are participants in everything that Jesus is about, in even the glory 
that Jesus has. He's made us somehow to be the beneficiaries of that by the grace of God. And it's not that he did this, now we do this in addition to what he's done because he didn't do enough. It's not that we can, nor that we ought, but it's our privilege to think about it, to believe it, to trust it, and to have a life then that confirms that we truly believe. That's what the apostle will be getting at here. When he says later on, don't let sin have dominion of, with, over you, it's not the reality. That's not who you are, a slave of sin. That's not who you profess to be. It's not the reality if you be justified by faith. This is what all of the exhortations are in the Bible. Be who you are, Church of Christ. Not who you're not. You're not in the realm of sin. Why do you go to Las Vegas? You're not in the realm of sin. You're not in the dominion of sin. Why do you give yourselves over to Las Vegas sorts of things in Grand Rapids? That's not you because it's not Christ and it's not grace. It's not what grace does. It's not becoming the gospel. There's a great temptation. We say we are those who are justified and we wrestle with the questions about maybe we still have an opportunity to sin here, but we can even walk in it. And you note here how the apostle wants to disabuse us of that notion when in Romans 8, 1, he says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but he reminds us that there's no condemnation to those only who walk according, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Pointing out to us the fact that if you're justified, you will not walk according to the flesh. You will walk according to the spirit. That's what the apostle is urging upon the people. And later on, he'll say in Romans 12, as a conclusion to the whole first 11 chapters, here's mercy, here's mercy, here's mercy, I beseech you by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God and not conform to the world, but transform by the re renewing of your mind. That's the thing. Christians, you're justified. You're nonconformists by definition, by walk, not by pedigree, but by grace. Christian, if you be justified, if you be declared to be right with God, you are then righteous, and this is seen in your walk, and your heart is not the same as it was. Sometimes I've used this, I don't know, here. There was a torture that was perhaps unknown but, or not, not too often done, but certainly done among the Romans, that in one way was even worse than crucifixion. And this is applying to what I want to say to you right now. The torture was this. They would take a condemned criminal, probably someone who would not bow to Caesar, and tie that condemned criminal to a corpse. You aware of this torture? They'd tie a condemned criminal to a dead body. The torture was that the dead body would be so attached to the criminal that the diseases and decay and maggots and worms of the dead body would infiltrate the living body. This was the slow death and torture the Romans. Now, there's something, some vital thing we need to learn here. When we sin, we're dancing with death. And that's what they would call this macabre execution, a dance with death. Because, you see, the criminal would seek to extricate himself from the embrace of the dead body. When we sin, we're dancing with death. And we are actively embracing death, and death embraces us. It's not a walk in the park, you know, when we sin. It's a walk in Death Valley. And the apostle is saying here, it's not right because it's not true of you. If you be God's, if you be Christ, if you be declared right with him, 
You're also a participant in the life of Jesus, and you're dead to sin. What are you doing? If you're not condemned, why are you yourself dancing with death, looking once even death's way and welcoming death into your home through that one-eyed monster on the television? Why? Well, reckon with these things, people of God. Reckon with these things because we preach it here. We preach it here. And whether in fact you live it or not, or whether in fact I live it very imperfectly or not, we're going to preach it here, however imperfectly. Jesus Christ is the redeemer of sinners and God justifies the ungodly. That's what we're going to preach here. But wouldn't it be an amazing thing if a church that preached justification by faith alone ended up adorning that doctrine with piety? Wouldn't it be something if from the head to the toe and from the toe to the head in all of our life, the children and the young people and the, the, the middle agers and the old timers were together in this because it's so that Jesus Christ is crucified. And because it's so that I am justified, I'm going to live unto him. Forget the waltzes with death. I'm going to dance the dance of the redeemed. That's holiness. And that's our happiness. Praise God. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we pray. We ourselves may adorn truth by faith and by this stubborn resistance to sin and putting on Christ. And we ourselves, Father, may be pious, holy, and in that way, Father, to show off just what grace is all about, making for a graceful people. And just what grace is all about, making for a godly people who are just like Jesus who's glorified. Oh, Father, give us the beginning. Give us, Lord, to continue on and to progress in faith as congregation, believers, and friends. For Jesus' sake, amen. We sing in response to the Word of God, 449, Psalter Hymnal, Fill Thou My Life. Here's a prayer song for sanctification, that every part of us would be filled with the holiness of God. 449, three stanzas.
before the benediction, I would like to invite all of the guests to linger long even at fellowship with us after the sermon. And also you're welcome, cordially invited to join us in a discussion on another very important part of the Reformation and of our whole life, a discussion on worship. God be praised. Receive his benediction. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this broadcast of Sovereign Grace United Reformed Church. Sovereign Grace Church, served by the ministry of Reverend Mitchell Dick, worships each Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the chapel of Kuiper College, located at 3333 East Belt Line Northeast, between Three Mile and Four Mile Roads. You are most cordially welcome to join us for worship or visit us online at www.sgurc.org or contact us by phone at 616-406-8562. It is our prayer that the Lord would add his indispensable blessing to this ministry in order that his name would be glorified through the edification of his people and the translation of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son.